Almost everywhere Jesus went, huge crowds came to see and hear him. One time, he began teaching by a lake. The crowd became so big that he actually had to speak from a boat out in the water. Jesus often told stories called parables about everyday life that were symbolic of who God was and what it meant to live in God's ways. Jesus also performed many miracles everywhere he went. He healed sick people and even raised some from the dead. He could also control the weather. One time when Jesus and his followers were in a boat on a lake, a huge storm came in and the boat began to fill with water. Despite the storm blowing the boat around, Jesus was asleep. Panicked, his followers woke him up and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Jesus stood up and commanded the wind and the waves, Quiet, be still. And the storm was gone. Many people were amazed at the miracles Jesus performed, but the religious leaders called Pharisees started to question where Jesus got his power from. At one point, they even accused him of getting power from the devil. King Herod was also fearful of Jesus. A short time earlier, Herod had thrown John the Baptist in jail. He wanted to kill John, but knew that he was a holy man and feared what might happen if he did. Then one day, Herod's daughter was dancing and entertaining Herod's guests at a banquet. Herod was pleased with her and told her she could have anything she requested. Herod's wife stepped in, telling their daughter that she should request the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Herod was fearful, but what could he do? He had promised to give his daughter what she requested, and so he had John beheaded and the executioners brought his head into the banquet. As Jesus' fame grew, King Herod began to worry that Jesus would bring John back from the dead. Even Jesus' followers began to have second thoughts about him. But his 12 closest followers stuck by Jesus for what was sure to be tough times ahead. Well, for those who have been uh, joining us, you know we're in a series called The Story. And if you're new to us today, uh, you're sort of smack bang in the middle of it. We've been going through uh, what is called The Story, which is an abridged version of the NIV Bible. And when I say abridged version, it picks up some of the key stories from Genesis through to Revelation. And uh, today we're sort of up to uh, part 24 and uh, we're in the New Testament and getting uh, really enjoying going through that. But it's the resources of Max Licato and Randy Frazee and uh, we acknowledge uh, their great resources, which is great. If you're reading along, for those who have got a copy of this, we've been encouraging you to sort of read a, a chapter each time. We're up to chapter 23. Or in the foyer, there's these, um, we call them the sort of verse maps, which have all the different Bible readings that's contained in here. Um, you actually know that it's uh, a lot in this week. And uh, basically, it's 17 pages of the life of Jesus, and it deals with the story of uh, Jesus and the soul, which we'll look at in a moment, the lost sheep, the lost coin, uh, the lost son, the Good Samaritan, the Sermon on the Mount, the Salt and Light, the Lord's Prayer, uh, with the story when Jesus talks about the house being built on the rock and on the sand, the story of Jesus calming the storm, the story of Jesus healing the demon-possessed man and sending the demons into pigs, uh, the death of John, to John the Baptist, the feeding of the 5,000, uh, Jesus walking on water and Jesus being the bread of life. Now, I've got 30 minutes to contain all that for you, so we should pray, and uh, hopefully that's one of the prayers should be, can I do this in 30 minutes? I'm not going to cover all those stories, so don't stress, um, otherwise we'll be here forever. But let's pray, and uh, let's look at all this uh, about what it's saying to us this morning. Let's do that. Well, Father God, we want to thank you for uh, the story and the resources that are there uh, from the Word of God. And Lord, we pray that as we look at some key stories that are contained in this, Lord, that you would speak to us. Lord, as I often pray, that we'll be different from when we walked in to when we walked out because we're actually being together with you and each other. And I really pray, Lord God, that you'll just speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the, the theme of today is no ordinary man. In other words, Jesus is certainly no ordinary man. From the moment of his conception uh, through to his childhood and birth and childhood and then through to his adult years, it's very clear that he's not an ordinary man. Last week we talked about him being God with skin on it, that he was God in the flesh and uh, certainly not an ordinary man. 
And it's impossible for me to cover all those stories of Jesus in within half an hour. So what I want to do is look at just three stories. Some of these stories you probably already know uh, or you've heard about. And uh, I want to encourage you if, you, if you are familiar with the stories, to actually try and approach it with fresh eyes and ask God, what is it you want to say to me today? So let's uh, start with the first one. Uh, as we look at Jesus uh, and the life of Jesus, we're going to oh, jump through. Gonna, here we go. Uh, going to look at this. This is the feeding of the 5,000, which many of you would know. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs that he performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up the mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. And when Jesus looked up and saw the crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him because he already knew in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, eight months wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up and said, Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far is that going to go amongst so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down, and there was plenty of grass in that place, and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, gather the pieces that are left over and let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of five barley loaves left over and those who had eaten, uh, left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the miraculous signs that Jesus did, they began to say, surely this is a prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Now, this, this is a story, I just love it, the fact that Jesus has taken some fish and some bread and fed over 5,000 people. The reason why we say over is because it says 5,000 men, not including women and children. So it's estimated there could be anywhere about seven to 8,000 people that he actually fed with just a few fish and a few loaves of bread. But the miracle is not just the fact that he fed them with this fish and the bread. One of the other miracles that we often overlook is that there was a young boy who gave up his lunch, who was willing to actually give up his lunch and give it to Jesus. And out of that, out of what he gave to Jesus, Jesus took and did the impossible. And I want to suggest this morning that as we look at this, this story very quickly, the fact that Jesus can t- to multiply something that is so small, I want to suggest this morning that Jesus can take whatever you're willing to give to him and can multiply that for his glory. So what is it this morning you have to give to him? Now, I'm not talking about lunch, but I'm talking about your life. I'm talking about your resources. I'm talking about your skills. I'm talking about everything that you have. Are you prepared to give it to Jesus like a 12-year-old boy? I find it fascinating that over 5,000 people, no one else had food. (laughs) Or maybe they did, but they weren't prepared to share it. They weren't prepared to surrender it to Jesus and say, Jesus, you take my food. You know, when the boy gave the food, he didn't know if he was going to get something to eat. He willingly gave it, surrendered it and said, Jesus, take what I have. And we know that Jesus took it and did the impossible. And I want to suggest this morning that whatever you bring to Jesus, whatever you give to Jesus, He will take and do the impossible. And I can testify that to my own life of just surrendering my life to him and just the way that he's worked in my life. And we heard that even with Alan and his his story, that Jesus will do a mighty work in your life if you surrender to him. As I said, we're quickly going through some of these stories. I'm going to touch now on the the story of Jesus calming the storm. And we read this in Matthew chapter 8. Then he got in the boat, that is Jesus, and his disciples followed him. Without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake. So the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. Really important to note that Jesus, although he was God with flesh on, he was was fully God and fully human. He was fully human. He was tired. He'd been ministering. He'd been working. He'd been engaging with people. And he was tired to the point that he was exhausted that he just put his head on the boat and went to sleep like that. I wish that would happen to me. I don't know about you, but I wish I could put my head on a pillow and just sleep like that. 
but he's in the boat and there's a storm around him. Now, I want you to think about it. The storm is, is going nuts. And, and here we're going to read in a second the disciples who are fearful. Now, many of these disciples were fishermen who would have seen a storm or two in their life, but yet this storm was so ferocious, they were fearful of their life. Let's read it. The disciples went and woke him up. Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. Just, just think about that. Massive storm and suddenly bang. Everything's calm. The waves are calm. I don't know about you, but if the storm stops, the waves are still going. But it was calm. Everything was calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Jesus is no ordinary man. You know, I can imagine uh, the, the report that they were so fearful that they were going to drown. You can imagine the headlines that says, Son of God tragically killed in storm. You know, like, like they were worried but not knowing the power and the authority that Jesus had. You see, Jesus had authority and, and, and still has authority, not only over all things, but over the wind and the power and everything. We actually read this in Matthew chapter 28, before he ascended to heaven. He said, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. Just like at the beginning of the world, when the world was created in and through him, as we read last week in, in the book of John, that God has given Jesus all authority on heaven and on earth. And that same uh, presence of God's Spirit, his Holy Spirit, is amongst us today. And I want to suggest that we need to live our lives on a daily basis, remembering that Jesus has all the authority in heaven and in earth. And maybe we should be obeying him a bit more than what we do. Maybe we should be following and serving him a bit more than we do. You now, Jesus not only said that he had all authority in heaven and earth, he also says this in John chapter three, uh, 6. He said, then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never go be thirsty. But as I've told you, you see me and still you do not believe. All the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all, none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last days. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life and I'll raise him up in the last day. We know that Jesus speaks often about him being the bread of life, that as we take that and receive that, it says he'll rise us up in the last days. He puts it another way in a verse that we all know. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. He came that we may have life and have it to the full. He is the bread of life and he invites us to take the bread and like any sort of meal that you have, you can't just stick it in your mouth and chew it around and then spit it out. You have to consume it. And what Jesus wants is you to take the bread, take him and consume him. Allow him to take over your life, surrendering your life to him. So that all who believe in him will not perish, but have eternal life. The last story that I want to look at as I'm quickly going through these is, is one of the uh, most powerful stories, the story of the, the, the parable of the sower. And so Jesus often told stories in parables. And I remember many people going, oh, yeah, Jesus told the stories of the parables to make it a bit easier for us to understand because a lot of the parables are about real-life examples such as farming and things like that. The problem is some of the parables just don't make sense. And Jesus didn't actually tell parables just to make it easier for the crowd. He actually told parables because it was actually prophetically said that he'd be speaking in parables. But he also said this in Luke. He said... The knowledge and the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, so that those seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand. And what Jesus is basically saying here is that some people are totally closed to 
the, the, the message of Jesus. And they're not, they don't want any, they want to live in darkness as we looked at a few weeks ago. They prefer the darkness over light. And it doesn't matter how much we speak that to people, they just don't want to hear. But there are others that are really fascinated by the gospel and they want to unpack it and the curiosity of it and they want to go further. And the parables make us go, what? What is this about? And explore it. You know, Jesus often asks questions rather than gave answers. We looked at this a while back. We did a series on the questions that Jesus asked. And a lot of it was the questions that he asked was to get us to think for ourselves. He didn't just spoon feed us. He gave us some comments like a parable for us to go, hang on, what does this mean? How do I unpack this? And often we have seen with the disciples that Jesus will speak something and everyone else in the crowd is sort of going, Man, I'm not sure about this. And then as he's walking with his disciples, he's unpacking it with them and telling them what it means. And this is an example of it, this parable of the sower, that Jesus speaks it and the crowd around are sort of going, oh, I'm not sure 100% what it is. But as he's walking with the disciples, he's unpacking it and telling them in more detail. So let's have a look at it. And a bit of it was read to us this morning, which is great. Such a large crowd gathered around him and he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, so he told many people things, this is one of them. A farmer went out and sowed his seed as he was scattering the seed. Some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and withered because they were, there was no root. Other seed fell upon the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop 160 or 30 times what was sown. He who have ears, let him hear. Now the disciples would have gone, yeah, I get that, a guy sowing. We've seen that plenty of times. In fact, as a kid, I remember sowing the backyard. You know, we had, we had the crops. And we know the concept that the good soil, it grows. Anything else, it doesn't. So they would have got that, but then the connection between what Jesus was saying and our spiritual life, you can imagine them sort of going, oh, I just don't get it, Lord. And we actually have this moment in Matthew when basically Jesus has a conversation with his disciples and they say, Jesus, why are you talking in parables? Why don't you just take it, say it as it is? And this is when he sort of said what I said before, that some people are going to hear it and some people are. And he then went on and unpacked this parable that we had read to us this morning. He says this, listen then this is what the parable of the sower means. Talking about the path. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed that's sown along the path. This is talking about those who are, who are non-believers, those who, who don't want anything to do with God. And let's be honest, in our world today, there are so many people who fit in this category. So many people who just don't believe. They've heard maybe parts of the Christmas story or parts of the Easter story. They've probably heard enough about the fact that there is a God, but they just go, no, nah, no. Nah. I, I don't want a bar of it. And I want to suggest today, particularly in Australia, there's a real apathy when it comes to faith. Most people don't want to pursue faith. In fact, faith is something they only think of, particularly when maybe they might be dying themselves or facing a major crisis. It's amazing even in our own nation when we push God so far out of our schools and out of everything, but when there's a crisis, our leaders will stand up and say, pray for us. The truth is there are so many people who have the opportunity to hear about Jesus and know Jesus, but there's a sense where they just go, no, I don't care. A real sense of apathy around it. You know, they don't care because the devil actually comes and snatches anything away from them. You know, the enemy does not want anyone to actually surrender to Jesus at all. So there are so many people who are non-believers in our world, even though they have glimpses of the story, even though they may have gone to church on a number of bases, but for whatever reason they sit there and go, oh, I'm not into this God stuff. Can I just say, if anyone is in that position right now, you either believe or you don't. You either go to heaven or you go to hell. There's no in-between here. And some people wrestle with this and go, I'm not really into the God stuff, but I'm happy for all the prayer, I'm happy for all the blessings, happy for all the favours that come from the God stuff, but just don't want anything to do. This is what he's talking about, those who are the non-believers, where it falls on the path and the birds come and take it away. 
He then goes on to say again in verse 20 of Matthew chapter 13 about the rocky places. He says, the one who receives the seed that fell on the rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But when, but since he has no root, he only lasts a short time. And when the trouble or persecution comes because of the world, he quickly falls away. And this is the people in our community over and over again who used to believe but no longer believe. They received the word of God and they thought, this makes sense. This is the answer I've been waiting for. They receive it with joy. They attend church for a period of time and they love God with all their heart, mind and soul. And then everything starts falling apart. Everything starts going bad and they go, oh, this is not worth it. I don't want to borrow this anymore. They still believe that there's a God. They still believe there's something out there, but I, I just don't want anything really. I don't want to follow this church thing. You know, church is boring. Church is dull. Can I just say, church is not about you. It's about actually worshipping God. Just saying. <laughs> you know, we go to church and we go, oh, I want to get something out of it because it's all about me. Well, no, it's not. It's not about you at all. It's actually about coming and worshipping Jesus. And you should be able to do that in any church if we're being honest. Any God-believing church. I used to believe, but I don't. The truth is that they believed, but the foundation wasn't there. They didn't, they didn't have a Christian foundation. They didn't have a sense of understanding the truths of God's word. And I want to suggest there's so many people in our world today who do believe, who once went to church, but for whatever reason, they don't anymore. And dare I say that a lot of people who have gone through crisis in their lives and, and have turned away from God, whereas if they had have turned to God, things would have been changed in their life. Not necessarily the circumstances straight away, but the peace that they carry, the presence of God that they carry. Jesus says those who actually have that, but basically the rocky places, there's no foundation able to. And he goes into Matthew chapter 13, verse 22, he goes on to say, the one who receives the seed that fell among from the thorns is the man who hears the word, but worries of his life and the seedfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. This, dare I say, contains a lot of people within our church communities today. People who actually hear the word and follow Jesus and do all they want, all they can, and, and dare I say, they, they attend church often maybe on a regular basis, but they've just never grown in their faith. They've just never got deeper in their faith. You know, the, 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 this is the Christian who, who just has never grown and matured in, 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 in their faith. And, and many in our Western world are like this. And I want to suggest today that Satan doesn't care how much Bible truth you have. What he cares about is those who actually live it out. You can have all the knowledge in your head, but if you're, not, if you're, if you're living it out, that's what the enemy fears. You know, today there are too many Christian auditors in our church. People who come and listen and, and prepare and, and, and enjoy the favour of being, but they're never prepared to do the work to go deeper in their faith with God. They just want to sit and hear the knowledge, but don't want to actually do any of the work in what it means to follow Jesus. They want to have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. And I just want to suggest this morning that you're just never going to live like that. It's like, it's like this situation where, where the thorns are going to come and choke you and cause grief in your life. You know, they, 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 they just never get into reading their Bible. They just never get into spending time in prayer. They just never get in time of worshipping God. Their, their church commitment on a Sunday is basically their, their faith. And yet when the rubber hits the road and all the tra traumas happen and, and, and they suddenly go, oh my goodness me, I'm struggling in my faith. I just don't really... Because the root's not there and the, and, and the thorns are around it and, and choking it and, and pulling it apart. Many people, sadly, who, are, who, who believe in God live their life like this. The challenge today is are you going deeper in your faith with God? Are you bringing a change in your life? Here's the challenge this morning. How's your Bible reading? How's your prayer life? How's, how's your involvement in ministry? Maybe today you need to make the decision that I'm actually going to go deeper with Jesus. I'm actually going to pick up the Bible and begin to read. I'm going to come to the chosen. You know, even if you don't read the Bible, come to the chosen and watch what goes on. Watch a video about Jesus. 
Now, James says this, come near to God and he'll come near to you. This is a promise from God that if you draw near to him, he's going to draw near to you. And I have so many people who say to me all the time, "Uh, Tim, I just don't feel and sense God's presence in my life. I believe God's there, but I just don't sense him. I don't feel him. I I, I just feel a bit numb when it comes to my faith. And my question always is, are you reading the Bible? No, no, no. Do you pray? No, not much. Do you worship God? Oh, other than than church, no other time. No wonder you're not going to feel the presence of God because it requires you to actively live out your faith, to actually open the Bible and read it. And these days, I want to be really blunt about this and I don't want to offend anyone, but... We can actually say, oh, I'm not a very good reader, so I don't read the Bible. There are apps out there that will read the Bible for you. Like, we are so lazy. We can press play and have the Bible read to us. You know, even the story, it's on audio book, so you can actually just have it played to you. You don't even have to open a book. You can just listen to it. We've got access to the Bible in more than any generation in the world. We can Google it and we can have the Bible, and yet we still go, oh, I don't have time to read the Bible. I've got time to watch all the movies on TV, but don't have time to read the Bible. Folks, it's a commitment. And what Jesus is saying in this parable is, if you don't have roots, if you're not building a strong foundation in your faith, the thorns are going to come, they're going to choke you, and they're going to just destroy you. And let's be honest, majority of us know it, because if you've been a follower of Jesus for any, any length of time, you've experienced some of this. When you've walked away from God or you're not as, not as strong in your faith, when the world comes and chokes you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Jesus then speaks into the good soil and he says this. He says, For the one who receives the seed that fell on good soil is a man who hears the word and understands it and produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. This is the, the full-on follower of Jesus, the disciple of Jesus, who's actually producing fruit. Now, Jesus says this, that this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. We, if you're a follower of Jesus today, then you've been created to bear fruit. Now, what sort of fruit are we talking about? We're talking about a whole lot of things, such as connecting with people and helping people come to know Jesus, praising God, worshipping God, having a sense of worship of life, using our resources for the kingdom of God, including our money and our, and our, and our talents and our skills using the works that we have, being of a Christian character. You know, in Australia right now, we need more and more people to be living out their faith for those who are Christians as a Christian character. The Christian character of living out things such as the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. I don't have time to go through this, but how are you going with some of those things? How are you going with love? How are you going with peace? How are you going with patience? Now, let's be honest, no one is going to be perfect while we're in this side of heaven. And even when we muck up, it's okay. God doesn't condemn us, but he forgives us. But what he says to us is, come on, let's keep journeying. Let's keep growing. The problem is some of us, we we keep mucking up and we just stay where we are. We don't grow. The idea of being forgiven of our sins is to learn from it so we don't make the same mistakes. When Jesus confronted the woman who was committed adultery and the crowd were at a persecutor, he said a powerful word. He says, I don't condemn you, but go sin no more. In other words, I'm not condemning you. Your life is better than this. Go live a better life. You don't have to be stuck doing this stuff all the time. And he says that to us this morning. Don't, I don't condemn you, but come on, there's a better way of living your life for me. Jesus again puts it this way in John 15. He says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And this is a scary one, verse 6. If anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown to the fire and burned. Folks, I don't want to ever be in a position where I'm picked up and thrown in the fire. I want to be someone who's producing fruit. And that's part of the Holy Spirit's role in our lives to transform us and to renew us. And the longer that we've been followers of Jesus, the more we should become like him in attitude, in thought and in action. You know, there's all those shows on TV where the makeover shows, you know, the the house makeovers or or the, the body image makeover or the backyard blitz. Remember those shows? 
you know, a lot of money, a lot of resources, a lot of people power go into making those shows. Imagine they go through the whole show and in the end they show the shot and it's the same backyard, no change. There's an expectation with those shows that everything is going to change and be transformed, yes? Dare I say as a follower of Jesus, there's an expectation that as you walk with him daily, you're going to change. You're going to be transformed. You're going to be renewed. What you're battling with last week is going to be different to what you're battling with this week. The thing that frustrates me about being a follower of Jesus, when you think you finally made it and you think, yes, I'm in a good space, God brings something else up. Now you've done that, let's work on this area of your life. There's a bit of a flaw in this. The language that you use, that's not too good. Let's work on that today. Oh. See, the idea of walking with Jesus is a relationship that you're learning and growing all the time. If you're... I want to be careful again, but if, you're, if you've not grown in your faith in the last month, then what are you doing? If you're just going through the motions because that's what you normally do, the thorns, the weeds, the worries of the world are going to choke you and pull you down. The good soil is a soil that's full of fertilizer, and yeah, that stinks. <laughs> but it's going to help you, shape you and mould you to become more like Jesus. I have been crucified with Christ that I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. You hear me say this all the time, more of Jesus, less of me. More of Jesus, less of me. Our whole life should be focusing on having more of Jesus in our life and less of ourselves. The good soil produces a fruit that enables that to take place. You know, you hear me say it all the time, but I pray just about every Sunday. And I pray the prayer that, Lord, that we'll be different from when we walk in to when we walk out because we've been with you and with others. But let's be honest, the truth is we can come in and out of church and go home and nothing's changed. And the challenge around that is it's not that God's not doing stuff. He is. The problem is we're not surrendering it to him. We're just happy going along with the motions. God wants to be continuing to be working in your life because Jesus is no ordinary man. He's the son of God. He's the Lord of lords. He's the king of kings. He's the creator of the universe. And he wants to have a personal relationship with you. And you cannot hang out with the creator of the universe without changing. And I'm not talking about just, mate, you know, don't feel guilty. I'm not talking about the major change. I'm just talking about little changes every day. The renewing of your mind. Because Christ lives in us. It's no longer I that live, but Christ lives with me. Well, folks, I want to close by singing a song that really talks about setting a fire in our heart. It talks about the fact that we're actually going to surrender control to God. For some of you, it might be a newer song. So I just want to encourage us to... Just stay seated if you want to, or you can stand if you want to. I just want to encourage you to reflect upon this. If you know the song, by all means, sing it. If you don't, just allow the words and the music to minister to you. But I want to really challenge you this morning. Where are you at when it comes to the soil? Are you on the path? Are you on the rocky ground? Are you in the thorns? Or are you in the good soil? Because maybe today you need to take a step to one of the different soils. Maybe today you need to surrender that the thorns have been choking you and you need to actually surrender that and move into the good soil. Maybe for some of you, you have that attitude of, no, oh, I don't think I need God. I know about God, but I don't need God. Maybe you need to step into the good soil today. My prayer as we sing this song that, that God will minister to you and speak to you and pour his spirit on you. Let me pray, Father, as we close this morning. My prayer is that we'd all step into the good soil that, Father God, that we'd all be willing to surrender ourselves to you and, and pray that prayer, Lord, that there'd be more of you and less of me. That, Lord, every day there'd be something fresh and new that you would do within our lives. And, Lord, that our faith in you would be something that is alive and dynamic and not just a routine or not just a habit, but, Father, a real relationship where we're talking and, and, and interacting with the creator of the world. And, Lord, I pray if anyone here this morning who doesn't know you personally, that you would just reach down from heaven and just touch them on the shoulder. Remind them that you're for them and you love them. And all you want is to have a relationship with us all. Would you minister to us now, I pray, 
In Jesus' name, amen. As I said, if you want to stand, feel free to stand. If you want to sit, feel free to sit. But my prayer is that as we listen to this and reflect upon this as we sing this, that we would know God's presence with us this morning. We know that when a fire is out of control, it just goes crazy. And my prayer this morning is that there'd be a fire that would be set in our own lives, that we just have more of Jesus and more of God in our lives. And Father, I pray this morning for wherever we sit in our relationship with you, that, Lord, this morning we'll just take one step closer to you. That, Father, as we, we have even heard in your word this morning, as we come near to you, as we draw near to you, we know that you draw near to us. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.